Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are now ready to start our first plenary session, which is titled India's Commodity Markets in 2025, Charting the Roadmap. For centuries, India's economy and society has been closely intertwined with commodities, and the growth of the commodity sector is an apt mirror of the growth of the larger economy itself. This gives us the belief that there is a lot of potential waiting to be untapped in India's commodity market, if the right things are done. Now, what exactly are those checkboxes to be ticked? What are the policies to be pursued? What are the entities that need to be engaged so that by 2025, India's commodity sector experiences a steady growth that all of us pine for? To explore a few of these questions, we have a presentation on the theme, followed by a panel discussion. So let's get started. I would like to invite Mr. Matthew Chamberlain, CEO of London Metal Exchange, to please come forward and deliver his presentation. Well, uh, thank you very much, and it is a great honor to be invited by MCX uh, to come and speak here at the India Commodities Day. Uh, India is a hugely important market for us at the LME, and our partnership with MCX is a very important strategic component of what we're doing. And I would, I'm very grateful, therefore, to have the opportunity to share some thoughts on how we can work together even more strongly in India and some humble suggestions for how the Indian commodities market can seize the opportunities that were discussed in the introductory session and play a full and, uh, and, and large role in global commodities and in particular global metals. So I'll start with a quick introduction to the London Metal Exchange just so you know who we are and what I'm talking about. And then I'll come on to the development of the LME and a number of the things that we've done uh, here in India together with our partners, and then talk about what we see as the opportunity for the Indian commodities market. So the London Metal Exchange, like most exchanges, it's hard to work out exactly when it started because it evolved like most exchanges from an OTC market that became increasingly organized through the centuries. And certainly, we have records going back to 1571 uh, of metals traders in London coming together to trade the two, uh, the two um, accessible metals at that time, copper and tin, which were the two metals that you could get in their pure forms without having to use modern metallurgical smelting techniques. Uh, and then it eventually, uh, the trading moved to the Jerusalem Coffee House uh, in London. And then the date that we normally take is 1877, uh, which was the date that the other people who were drinking coffee in the coffee house got tired of all these traders shouting at each other and told them to go and start an exchange. So in 1877, we started the London Metal Exchange, and we've been going ever since. And as I say, we started off with copper and tin, and then new contracts have been added as science and technology have moved. So actually back 1877, aluminium was more expensive than silver because the electro refining process hadn't been invented. Actually, if you look at the top of the Washington Monument, there is a small pyramid of aluminium which was put there to show the prosperity of the United States because aluminium was such a precious metal at that time. Uh, obviously, now it's significantly more accessible. So what do we do? Well, most people know the LME for its trading ring. We're certainly the last open outcry venue left in Europe. Uh, and if any of you uh, are in London, please feel free to drop us a note. And we're always happy to take guests for a, a tour of our trading ring. It's still pretty noisy. The, the core services that we provide, like pretty much every exchange, are price discovery, uh, hedging, and delivery. So that's what we aim to do. We aim to be a physical market. And we do that by allowing people to trade across three venues, our ring, which is the open outcry floor, LME Select, which is the electronic platform, 
and the inter-office or telephone market. But I think it's important when we think about commodities to realize the exchanges sit at the center of a much bigger ecosystem. So the exchanges are just the very visible tip of all of the physical market activity that's taking place. And we heard earlier about things like the convergence of futures and spot prices, delivery mechanisms, participants. These are all questions that the LME has had to grapple with and is still grappling with. Uh, and I think are very in interesting questions for the Indian market uh, as well. But the key point that we try to maintain is the robustness of pricing. So ultimately, an exchange is only as good as the pricing that it can uh, deliver. Uh, and that's why we work quite hard to ensure that our pricing mechanism genuinely reflects the price of the underlying metals uh, for on a global delivery basis. Um, and again, like all exchanges, uh, we are, well, like, like, like most commodities exchanges, very much driven by those global reference prices, physical market commitment, the transparency of what we do, and the development of our market. So that's the LME in a nutshell. So the LME itself is developing, and this is where I think our future really coincides with that of the opening up of the global commodities markets, and India in particular. Just as a sign of the importance of the Asian region to metals, we were acquired back in 2012 by Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, and that the, the, the industrial logic for that transaction was really the fact that Asia is now the dominant center for the supply and demand of metals. Obviously, the United States and, and the Americas are still very important for us. Europe is still very important. But Asia is really becoming the key global metals hub. And people talk a lot about China, but I think India is increasingly important. And what we've done at the LME after the acquisition by HKEX is to undertake a little bit like we're talking about in, in the context of the Indian commodities markets, a fairly fundamental strategic review of who we want to be and who we want to serve. Uh, and I think there's, it's actually fascinating to hear what was discussed earlier and, and to see that that has a lot of parallels with the strategic review that we ourselves have been through. So this question of, are you a market that's there primarily to serve the physical, or are you there primarily to serve financial? We've been very clear that we're primarily there to serve the physical market, but of course, that will create opportunities for financial speculators, and those financial speculators add liquidity, which is important for physical market participants to be able to hedge in. Similarly, the question of delivery and physical structure, which I think is going to be a key one for the Indian commodities markets over the coming years. We operate, as I'll come on to in a minute, a global network of warehouses. I would emphasize that running a, network, a warehouse network is an extremely uh, time-consuming task. Because uh, I can say from experience, generally, it's reasonably easy to to regulate a, a futures market or a forwards market. You have to look out for certain behaviors, but in general, you know what you're looking for. When you operate a delivery network, you're then bringing together that futures market with the global physical market, and the situations that can arise there when people actually want to take metal out or put metal in, the questions you get about who can take metal out first, how you schedule that, where who has to have their trucks where, disputes between people delivering and receiving metal, it really is a very significant task. Uh, but it's one that we've committed to because we believe that a physically delivered market is vital for the price discovery that we want to produce, and I think it's of increasing importance to the Indian market as well. So what we've ended up with at the LME is quite a bespoke market structure. And there's four elements that I would raise in particular. So we have a physically settled market. We clear our contracts using something called discounted contingent variation margin, which effectively means that traders don't get their profits back on a contract on a daily basis. 
And that's because physical traders who are hedging far forward don't want to have to put up significant cash margin when the market moves against them because their physical represents the other side of the hedge. So our margining structure is very much aimed at those physical market participants. Unlike pretty much every other market, we are a daily market. We're not a monthly futures market. We're a daily market. So we offer delivery every day. And I'll come on to the significance of that. And we also have an industrial lot size. We have a 25 ton contract uh, for aluminum and copper, which is a significant amount uh, compared to the needs of a speculator. But for a physical participant, that's what they're, what they're looking for. So we've made some quite specific decisions which really orient the LME contract towards the needs of physical market players, particularly large physical market players. Nowhere is that more evident than in our so-called prompt date structure. So we have a daily date structure, so you can trade for any day over the next three months. We then have a weekly structure and then a monthly structure beyond six months. So uh, uh, rather than having a standardized monthly date where liquidity concentrates on each month, we offer daily trading, um, which again is very important for our physical market players because they will generally be doing averages of those daily dates to match their physical supply contracts. But it's more difficult to use for perhaps financial speculators or indeed smaller physical players who are more used to a monthly futures market structure. So with that as background, what do we think are the opportunities for the Indian market, particularly around base metals, but also, uh, I would say, more generally in commodities? Well, we have a, a rich history in India, which started back in 2003 when our first Indian brands were listed. In 2005, we first entered into our fantastic partnership with MCX, did our first road show in 2012, and then we had our first member uh, from India in 2015. So India is hugely important for base metals, and I don't need to go into the details. Everyone in this room knows, but in terms of pre uh, percentage of global consumption of aluminium, of zinc, production, um, and, uh, and the increase in demand as industry has needed more and more metal, particularly in the automotive sector, but in other areas as well. So as I said, our first, our primary link with India is the number of brands which are listed. So we have eight Indian uh, aluminum brands, three copper brands, two lead brands, and four zinc brands. And that means that those producers can produce metal which can be delivered and transacted on the exchange. So that liquidity, that stock coming from the Indian producers is vital for us in terms of global market liquidity, but it's also very important for those producers in terms of making sure that their metal can be transacted globally. Now, the next thing that we were able to do in India, as I say, was working closely with MCX. And what MCX has done in, I think, a very effective way is to build contracts that reference LME prices, but are more catered to the needs of smaller physical and financial players here in India. So MCX takes our prices, but they take, they, they use an RVM, a realized variation margin, a standard futures market structure rather than DCVM. They use a monthly future structure, so more akin to what most Indian users are, are, are used to and they package it in a five-ton contract structure, which is more, which is more um, in line with the requirements of some of the smaller physical players here. So I think that's the first point that I would make, that Indian exchanges, even if they're using global prices, can take those global prices and package them into product, which is more readily accessible for this market. But I don't think it's just more readily accessible for this market. Actually, I think in many ways, it's a more attractive product for many users than the core LME product. The core LME product is designed to be used by those big physical players. Financial players actually prefer accessing the LME price 
through the structure that MCX have used in many cases, rather than the core LME structure, because of that convenience of the monthly futures, that convenience um, of, the, uh, of the margining, etc. And that's why if you look at this graph, the dark blue shows the volume transacted on the LME, and the light blue shows the, the, the volumes transacted on MCX, but linked to LME prices. And it's a small but significant proportion of total trading on LME prices that's actually happening on MCX. And I think that's a huge success story because that is an Indian exchange taking a global price and packaging it in the right way for the Indian market. And I think that's been a, a huge testament to the, um, the skill uh, of the team here. And you can see that in another form on these pie charts that you can see if you look at global trading, so let's look, for example, at, um, uh, at zinc, so a very important metal uh, in the context of, of India. So LME has a 64% market share, Shanghai 33%, but actually MCX on the LME price 3%. And even more for lead, MCX is transacting 7% of global lead volumes using our price, uh, which is, uh, I think, you know, beginning to get to, to represent the significance of the Indian market in terms of lead. So I would strongly urge the Indian markets to understand the value of what they've constructed here and the value of having a contract that is specifically catered for the needs of this market. But actually, I think we can go further in the Indian story. So the LME is deliberately a global contract. And when we say that, we mean that we maintain delivery warehouses all over the world. So in the US, across Europe, in the UAE, and then across Asia. There are two obvious countries that are missing from this map. One is mainland China, and the other is India. And I think there is a great opportunity for us to work together to bring India into this delivery picture. Because if we could have LME warehouses in India, then I think it would be even more uh, clear that the LME price, that global price, it doesn't belong to any one country, it belongs to global industry, is reflecting supply and demand here in the Indian market. Because if there is an oversupply of metal here in India, it can be put into Indian LME warehouses, and if there is an undersupply, metal will naturally, through the mechanism of arbitrage, move into India through the warehouse network. That's not to say it's easy. We deliberately have an offshore, a tariff-free warehouse structure. We'd have to figure out how that works. But I think this opportunity is a great one for the Indian market to look at seizing so that we can make sure that the LME global price fully reflects Indian supply and demand trends. And that really brings me on to my last, last point, which is sort of a, a philosophical observation for the Indian market, but it's one that I believe very strongly in. So there are some commodities where regional pricing makes sense. So agriculture, uh, agricultural commodities, for example, are regionally specific. They're costly to move. They've often spoiled by the time you move them. So that's why we have regional prices for agricultural products. Base metals, I argue, is a global market. They move around the world. The cost of transport is low compared to their value. They can be stored indefinitely. Metal moves all around the world based on supply and demand. So that left-hand model where you have a set of different prices makes sense where there isn't really fungibility of the commodity between your countries. The right-hand side, the global pricing model, is where you have a global price, so in the case of, say, aluminium, the LME price, and then you have a set of premiums on top that represent the specific supply demand um, drivers in, say, the US or Europe or China or India. Now, I think, and I would strongly say, and clearly I have an interest in this, so you need to, you need to discount it. I would declare my commercial interest. But I strongly believe that we will be better served if we maintain a global price for, for our metals and we try to make that global price apply to everybody by having LME warehouses everywhere. So that goes back to my first point 
about LME warehousing in India to ensure that Indian supply and demand is fully incorporated into LME global pricing. But the second element is then, can we work together to find an Indian premium? So what is the premium or discount of metal onshore in India versus metal in the offshore LME network? So that that price can be readily discovered and hedged through an exchange contract. So I think there's actually a very interesting opportunity to work together to find an Indian premium for these metals, which everyone can trust just as much as the LME price. And then you add together your LME price and your Indian premium, and that is the clearly discovered price of onshore metal here in India. Most premiums are currently done through survey pricing, which works well in, in the vast majority of cases. But I think there's a great opportunity for India to leap ahead and to discover its local regional premium prices through a strong exchange mechanism. And in that sense, it would really lead the world in terms of how you discover that premium. And then the third point is to make sure that all the elements of that, so both the global price, in this case the LME price, and the Indian premium are readily accessible to Indian users. As I say, I think in the MCX product, we already have a fantastic way for Indian users to access the LME price in the way that they would like to do so. And if we could have an Indian premium, which is, which is accessible and tradable and hedgeable through an exchange, then you would have all of those components. So again, I think the Indian market needs to explore what's right for it. Uh, it's for India to decide how it wants to price commodities. But I would, again, acknowledging my self-interest, emphasize the, our strong belief in a global price for global commodities and encourage India to be a full part of discovering, trading, and calculating premiums off that price. So that's really all I wanted to say. I hope we have a fantastic panel discussion, but we're going to thank, once again thank you for the opportunity.